I want to continue with fundamental matters as we did this morning on those first principles. And I'd like to speak to you this afternoon on the topic of the silence of the scriptures. I think we all know that in general the religious world around us, and I'm afraid even some members of the church, have believed for a long time that you can prove anything by the Bible. And this false notion has arisen primarily because of what the Bible does not say. <coughs> Some hold to the idea that we simply cannot understand the Bible. And that suits many people because that means that you don't have to be too concerned about what it says. Since you can't really do anything but prove anything about the Bible anyway. But letting the Bible speak for itself, the Bible teaches we can understand it. And we announce as we preach the truth, the Bible can be understood. Now, will it be understood? That's another story. But the Bible can be understood. Note the question, how could God place our salvation, now watch it, upon that which is written and then infallibly give us that which is written, knowing all the time that we couldn't understand that which is written. That is absurd to say the best you can about it. The word understand occurs about 300 times in the Bible. And the inspired apostle Paul wrote, Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5, 17. Well, these people were Christians. They'd already understood the will of the Lord as to what one must do to become a Christian because they'd become Christians. They had obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which had been delivered them. And they were at their obedience made free from sin. Romans 6, 17 and 18. But again we read in Ephesians 3 and verse 4, Paul writing, Whereby when ye read... Ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3, 4. That which has been unrevealed is now revealed. And you can understand what I know as an apostle of Christ concerning salvation when you read the words I wrote. Well, I think it's a bit strange to say the best you can that some can read into the text that which is not written. <laughs> So I want us to study the scriptures in respect to the silence of the scriptures. And I think you'll see that there's always been a need for this particular study. Go with me first back to the Old Testament. And we'll begin our study there. A very familiar passage to Bible students in Leviticus chapter 10 verses 1 and 2. Scripture reads this about priests of God, not long after all of it was set up under the old economy. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them a censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Again, that's Leviticus 2, 1 and 2, 10, 1 and 2. He commanded them not. Now, I don't have to know, and we won't even go into it now, where God said that fire must come from. All I need to know in this case is that it did not come from where God said it should come from. They operated on the basis, the silence, of the Mosaic economy dealing with such things. 
What did the Lord think about him? Well, we can't understand the Bible anyway. I gave them my will and words, but they can't understand it anyway. No, he took their lives. All these things are written before time for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures of the scriptures might have hope, Romans 15, 4. You can understand the Bible. God expected these men under the old law, the law of Moses, to understand where God had authorized them to do whatever they were to do. And that's the reason it says it's strange fire. Is because it was not authorized by the law of Moses. He did not command it or authorize it. They could have found out because God doesn't treat people needlessly this way. God gave us the word so we can understand it. He gave them the word so they could understand it. But they didn't, and whose fault was it? Their own. And they paid the price. In Joshua 6, verses 10 and also verse, uh, verse 20, we'll jump down to verse 20. In taking the city of Jericho, here's part of what he said. Ye shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, neither shall any word proceed out of your mouth. Now watch. Until the day I bid you shout. Now we come on down to verse 20 and the scripture reads, so the people shouted. Now what must I understand from that? He gave them the authority to shout. So what he had given them, be quiet, is now broken by his word. He's not silent on anymore as to when they should shout. So the people shouted, and the priests blew the trumpets, and it came to pass when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, that the people shouted with a great shout, and the wall fell down flat, so that the Bible went up, that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Again, Joshua 6, 10, and 20. They acted on the basis of the words that manifested the authority of the Lord. Read Hebrews 11, which is the great chapter of Old Testament faithful who never knew the New Testament at all, never knew anything about it. And yet they did what God told them to do in the way God told them to do it and for the reason God told them to do it. And they're listed as examples to us, patterns to follow, we who are under the authority of Christ and the words of the New Testament. And the New Testament continues to emphasize these very things. We saw this this past week. In Ken's teaching on Wednesday night, in Hebrews 7, verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. Now you have to get into the context of 7 as to what the writer's trying to do for the benefit of those he is writing to. But it's basically saying that the law of Moses is still that by which you approach, approach God acceptably and Jesus couldn't be a priest because priests come from the tribe of Levi Jesus came from the tribe of Judah but Jesus is the high priest thus the law had to be changed and the law of Moses was silent as the tomb concerning any priest ever coming out of Judah that's the very point that's being made in Colossians 3.17. Whatsoever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father by him. And you see how that harmonizes with Peter's writing to Christians in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. If any man speak, let him speak. <clears throat> the white space between the lines. <laughs> it doesn't say that. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. Why? That God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Over the years, Hebrews 7.14 has been brought up in debates of right and left. There have been books written on it. 
all sorts of things, mainly by those trying to justify the mechanical instrument of music and the worship of God. And you can get some very interesting studies in some of the old debates, if you can find them, where the Christian church primarily try to use that and saying, well, the Lord has not spoken. We're free to act. Well, all I can say is go visit Nadab and Abihu and see how that works. You'll remember that in the early days of the restoration of ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity in the early 19th century, in fact, in the first decade, uh, the men had not come that far along in understanding a lot of things. That just a few years later, they would. But they had come to the conclusion that you must have the Bible as the only rule of faith and practice. They didn't know the implications of that. They didn't know where that was going to take them, but they knew that was right simply because of such scriptures as 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And thus, Thomas Campbell, father of Alexander Campbell, in 19, uh, 1809, simply said, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we are silent. Now, he didn't come up with that all by himself. A fellow back many hundred years before that, a fellow by the name of, <coughs> excuse me, Millenius, his last name, <coughs> Rupert Millenius. Anybody looking for the name of a baby, there's your one. Had said that in essentials, I'm quoting, unity, in non essentials, liberty. And all things charity. Well, I think Thomas Campbell got it better. Where the Bible is silent, where the Bible speaks, we speak. Where the Bible is silent, we're silent. If that doesn't imply you've got to study the scriptures and know what the words mean, I don't know what it would say. And they knew that. They didn't know where all that idea was going to lead them as to what they believed and practiced religiously, but they knew that. But this is we need to study the scriptures and get out of them only what God put into them for us to get out of them. And we will respect when we do that the principle of the silence of the scriptures. Now some of what I'm going to give now, you're familiar with it. But I guess I can say, uh, as Peter did this second epistle, Beloved, now I write unto you in which both I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Because the scriptures authorized by direct statement. Now somebody says, you invented direct statement. No, it didn't. <clears throat> a direct statement was doing what a direct statement does long before anybody ever called it a direct statement. For that matter, any rule of grammar was doing what a verb, let's say, was doing before anybody ever called it a verb. <laughs> it's in the nature of language. In fact, there's a word for it we don't use much anymore. It's called coval. It's in the very nature of the case. It's the way language works. If I'm to communicate to you something, then one of the ways I do it is a direct statement. And that's very important to understand. When I read that one must believe in Christ, one must, well, before that, believe in God, and one must believe in Christ, repent of sins, and one must confess faith in Christ and one must be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, I can find all that set out in direct statements. The Bible teaches by implication, Acts 8, 35 through 36. All the scripture says there as to what Philip preached to the Ethiopian eunuch is that he preached to him Jesus. But for some reason or other, in preaching to him Jesus, he said, see here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? So that word Jesus is a synecdoche key where it stands for the whole of the gospel as to what one must do to be saved. And the man understood that by implication. The Bible, through Luke's writing, teaches us that. That's another way the Bible authorizes. And then the third is example. 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 25. From that passage, I am commanded to observe the Lord's Supper. I'm instructed by example to observe that supper on the first day of every week, Acts 20 and verse 7. Thus, I'm authorized to follow that pattern so that I'll know when to obey the commandment to partake of the Lord's Supper 
So God will be happy with it. Now you've got other examples. They partook of it in the upper chamber. They partook of it where there were many lights. But none of that has a bearing on the actual discharging the obligation of taking the Lord's Supper. That just means we can do it in an upper chamber or where there are many lights. And so when I understand the Bible account of an action of the early saints and how that becomes an example which we must follow or we may follow, all depends upon what's being talked about, what's being said. It takes a little thinking on the part of man, and God gave us that ability to think. Well, why didn't he do it different from that? Did you ever think that God just wants you to prove your faith and love of him so that you will study and dig and get after it and prove how much you want to know? Just go through all sorts of things in the New Testament and the Old Testament, just through the whole Bible. Of how many times God did all sorts of things and let a person just go through all sorts of things and work his, himself through it so he would understand and appreciate things. Here's a little example of building the ark. Why did God have Noah build that ark? Why? If he could bring the flood that he brought and the way it came and the cataclysmic thing it caused on earth, I couldn't have said, all right, this is coming. Do you believe it's coming? He said, yes, all right, here's your ark. I'll even put you on and shut the door. Because, man, the way we're constituted, the way God made us, and why we're here in time and space is designed for us to prove to him our faith and fidelity. This is a place for proving to God, I want to go to heaven. I don't like sin. I hate sin. I don't like it when I sin. I don't care about this world. It's a place where Satan has the control he wants. I don't care about any of that. I don't like to be sick. I don't like to get old, Ken. I told Ken here a week ago Wednesday, I guess it was, or was it this? No, it was maybe it was Sunday afternoon on our trial thing. I said, when was the last time we were on this? I said, I look like I've aged. But you know what, Ken? I was looking at you on that thing and not me. <laughs> Not really. But, but there are all sorts of things about this life that says you can't, it's not easy. Well, why did the Lord make it easy? Well, do you want to counsel the Lord as to how you ought to do that? Do you think he knows how to best get us ready to be in heaven with him? I don't think I want to try that. So we have to learn how to study. We have to use the mind God gave us. We have to put it through the paces and practice with it. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly divide. I've got to learn to do that and do it. Rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. Well, further, we recognize <coughs> the difference between You've heard me say this many times and others too. I don't know how many times Bruce probably said all this. Explicit statements. Just so many words, they say what they say. Now, everything in the Bible is taught either explicitly or implicitly. No other way it can teach. There's no other way it can teach. Now, think of Saul of Tarsus when he became a Christian. Think of it as as his involvement with complying with each step in the plan of salvation. He heard the instructions of Christ, but he didn't learn anything from Christ about what must I do to be saved and the moment I'm saved and how I'm saved. But he knew Christ was a Savior. But he told him to go to Damascus Street called Straight, and there would be told him what he must do. Must do. Not make sure people say, well, there's nothing, you can't do anything. It's not imperative. Jesus said, you go there and you'll hear what you must do. 9, 4, and the verses following, as well as second account, Genesis 22, verses 3, 13 through 16. Now, he couldn't have faith in Christ except they had been brought to believe, Acts 9, 6, 22, 10, and that he obeyed, that's implied, repentance. That is, he repented, Acts 17, 30. He confessed that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, Acts 9, 6, 22, 10, and so on. And then, of course, we find him at that stage as Ananias comes and learns about all this and knows that he has one more step to make, that he hadn't completely obeyed the gospel. He's on the road. 
Yeah, but he's, always, he's already gone through the spot that says you must hear the word, you must believe those spots, if you please, on the road to salvation. Repent, confess your faith. So he says, now why tarryest thou? Arise, be baptized, wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. And he completed his obedience as to becoming a Christian. Now there's nothing <clears throat> in the Bible, as I've said so many times, that states that Saul of Tarsus, in the process of becoming a Christian, repented of his sins. Look, all you want to look, and it's not there. How do I know he repented? Because nobody can become a Christian without repenting, and Paul became a Christian. Is that simple? I think it is. Then we look further. We can agree on what is written. But so many times we disagree when talking, when thinking about, when speaking of the silence and what the Bible does not say. Now, remember what I preached this morning about what the church in the first century, once it was established, did in their conduct, which involved their worship. There were no denominations. There was no kind of thing like that. It was just the church, the Lord's church, Jesus' is head, Jesus' is Savior. His word governs it. The gospel's God's power to save, and so on. So we notice that denominational people will not claim that you have to be a member of their particular denominational church to be saved. And they'll not say that, well, when you're saved, that automatically makes you a member of the denomination of which I'm a member. None of them will say that. Well, then why in the world be a part of any of it? In Exodus 3, 1 through 3, I want to read this and then make some observations. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God to Horeb. Now, you've got to remember, Sinai is Horeb. Horeb is Sinai. That had two names. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire. But the bush, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Exodus 3, verses 1 through 3. Now here's the observations. What kind of a bush was it? Bible silent on it, didn't it? But I promise you, in some theological classes, you can get into a great debate about trying to figure out what kind of bush that was. Well, let's add another to it. How big was the bush? And when does a bush cease to be a bush become a tree? Was this a small tree or was it a bush? You can get all kinds of discussions like that. And you can go on down the line. The Bible's silent on it. We accept what God said and understand in the words what he said. Because faith comes by hearing him by the word of God. Sometimes take scriptures, just write down the facts that are mentioned in that scripture. You'll do yourself good in studying the Bible. Such as, did Moses see a bush? Yes. Did he see a burning bush? Yes. Did the, was the bush cons consumed by the fire? No. Those are facts. They can't be controverted. Well, look at John 3, 1 through 2. Another one we've used many times. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the same came to Jesus by night and goes ahead to tell about it, said unto him, thus and so. John 3, 1 through 2. Let's observe a few things to make our point. I'm sure somebody here knows this. Why did Jesus come to, why did Nicodemus come to Jesus by night? Well, if you do know the answer to it, let me ask you this, this one. Uh, what hour of the night did he come? So surely if you know the first one, you can answer that one. Well, the Bible doesn't say. Fact, he came to Jesus by night. His name was Nicodemus, and it was Jesus to whom he came. And then we can go through the rest of it, simply writing down the facts of the case. In John 8, 6, Scripture reveals this, they said, 
tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Did Jesus hear them? It says as though he heard them not. Now notice, what did he write on the ground? <laughs> Nobody knows. Oh, by the way, if you do know what he wrote on the ground, which finger do you use? Do you use more than one? But these things will cause people to get in all sorts of whatevers, but the Bible is silent on it. They ought to be discussing what is said, what are the facts in the case, and so on. But another one, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Paul wrote, And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now you can find umpteen commentaries to begin to discuss what was Paul's thorn in the flesh. And I read a bunch of them, and they didn't know, and I don't know. <laughs> so why spend time on it? What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? I don't know. All right, let's move on. It's not there. And for almost 2,000 years, people have done this. And you can find some quite, quote, quote, scholarly people who have written on this. Well, if you do know what it was, would you tell me how long you had it? That's another question you can't answer. And you can go on and on with things like that. We concentrate on the word said and how you interpret words according to the way a language works knowing God communicated to us in words that which we must know to be saved so we ought to be spending time with these words then there is the law of inclusion law of exclusion we expect meals when we're eating out of a restaurant or some joint <laughs> the greasy spoon we expect them to be delivered to us as ordered, all other things being equal. And this includes what we ordered and excludes, excludes what we did not order. And what we ordered is what was authorized. If you have a menu that says, here's what we got. If you don't like what's on this menu, then you may have to go somewhere else. So there is that which we ordered, and we made it clear what we wanted. But then they come bringing us something we didn't want. They didn't respect our silence, and they didn't pay attention to what we said. Have you ever told that to somebody? You didn't listen to me. You can't understand what does you didn't listen to me mean. <laughs> it doesn't make much sense. Well, there's the old gopher wood story. I wonder why it's there. I wonder why God in his wisdom put that there, written before time for our learning. Genesis 6, 14, in building the ark, God said to Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. I don't know what gopher wood is. He did, and that's all that mattered. Make me an ark of gopher wood. Rooms, plural, shalt thou make in the ark. Thou shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. Why was it wrong? to use any other wood other than gopher wood because it wasn't authorized. That which is not authorized is excluded. And the law of identity comes in here. Gopher wood. Noah could identify it and know its difference from other woods. And he had no authority to use other woods. Now, if he had said gopher wood and sweet gum, then two things would have been offered. He could have used gopher wood and sweet gum, but he didn't, did he? And I'm sure there'd have been somebody there saying, well, why can't we use pine? Said, anybody around there do that, at least like they are nowadays. And again, I remind you of Nadab and Abihu offering that strange fire, that unauthorized fire. It was included because it was authorized. Theirs was excluded because it wasn't authorized. That's why it was strange. People were using mechanical instrument music and worship to God. That's strange music to God. It's unauthorized. People want to partake the Lord's Supper whenever they get ready. That's strange action as far as God's concerned because it's strange to the authority of the New Testament of the Christ. Why do we have unleavened bread and the fruit of the vine 
making up the emblems of the Lord's Supper. We come across that in Matthew 26, 26 through 28. It's because the law of inclusion and exclusion. We have authorized, that's included. Not authorized, it's excluded. Very simple. And we've already mentioned mechanical instruments of music. Ephesians 5, 18 through 19, Colossians 3, 16, letting him stand for anything the Bible has to say, the New Testament about the kind of music whereby God is worshipped. It says sing, period. Well, but, but, but. Just go with what's written. You're sure in that way to be right when it comes to the music God wants and will accept. Now, I said in starting, this was another first principle matter. But you'll find out when people leave the truth and the church goes after all sorts of strange things, unauthorized things, things the New Testament doesn't teach, that it's because somebody hasn't been paying attention and to routinely use every day of their life these fundamental matters. But they don't change. And everything else in the Bible, if you want to call it the more meaty matters, they are based on the fundamentals, the foundation. So when you read 2 Timothy 2.15 about rightly dividing the word of truth that we've got to study, that we are doing this to be approved of God, then know that God knows best. Now, used to, there was a television show back in the 50s, early 60s, Father Knows Best. I don't know how they would do if they were going to do that today because you don't know whether you're a father or not a father. You don't know whether you're a man or, or a woman or whether you are going to be tomorrow or not. <laughs> you may change your mind. So every, everything as far as the fundamentals and foundations of morality has been cast aside. People are adrift. I listened to a woman. I think I put it on Facebook. Copied it off of, off of uh, somewhere on the Internet. It was one of these women testifying for Congress in the last month or so. It had to do with abortion. And they were, one of the man questioning her asked her, can a man get pregnant? She had that little silly, stupid look on her face, and that's my observation, but you can go back and look at it and see if you can't come up with the same idea. She said, yes. In my view of the matter, you waste time on trying to deal with people like that. They have cast themselves away. They have thrown reason to the wind. They have rebelled against everything that God put in them to allow them to come to a knowledge of the truth. They're rejecting the truth. Because she may say, well, I'm a woman today, I'll be a man tomorrow. And in between the time, I'll be trying to figure out whether I'm one or the other. Now you say, well, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's worse than ridiculous. That's where people are today. And you might be surprised when you deal with people around about you, how many of them are caught up in that. Because once they cut loose of the fundamentals of the Bible being the very word of God, and that is to guide us, and that's the way God guides us, and we've got to study it and learn how to authorize this. We're to abide in the truth and not over here in the silence of the scriptures. Anything goes. Just a matter of time till it gets there. Well, if you're not a Christian, we've studied what to do to become one this evening. We trust that you will, if you need to, believe that Christ, Son of God, repent of your sins, confess your faith in him, and be baptized for the remission of sins. If you've sinned as a child of God, we ask you to humble yourself. Repent of those sins and confess them and we'll pray with you and for you for forgiveness. But you need to do it now while there's yet time as we stand and sing.